Hello everyone, welcome once again for our event, Women, Policy and Political Leadership, Regional Perspective in, order, in honor of International Women's Day and also in the US is celebrating Women's Month. Welcome everyone and everybody in attending. My name is Benedicta Jumpa and I'm Student Life Coordinator here at Temple University Rome. And I coordinate also the diversity and inclusion initiatives here at Temple Rome. And this event is part of this initiative to raise awareness on issues regarding uh, gender equality. This event is organized in collaboration with the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung Political Dialogue Asia and also with the Asia Democratic Leader Alliance. This event, uh, I want to welcome the members of the parliament and the politician representative from Indonesia, Bangladesh, Mongolia, and South Korea. And also I want to welcome the scholars connecting with us today. I want to welcome our student, faculty, and guests to this event. So on International Women's Day, sometimes we hear uh, this spot that the reason really I need to celebrate International Women's Day, Women's Day is every day, but every day we are reminded that we need to honor International Women's Day and Women's Month because still the achievements of our women are not fully appreciated and are mainly due of challenges, social, economical and cultural barrier, barriers. And we can see this across the globe. In Italy, for example, the national statistics have recently shown that 98% of women that lost their job during this pandemic are women, 98% of the unemployed people. And this deeply impacts all women, and especially migrant women as well, and trans women as well. Currently, women only serve as other states, only have 20 countries between other states and uh, between uh, of governments as well. In 119 countries, we never saw a female leader. And globally, we have less than 25% representatives of women between different parliaments. This event is so important to make you understand that we still need to work for gender equality. So in our program today, we will have uh, different points of discussion between our program. Uh, our first part of the program, uh, we will soon have the remarks for our Dean, Dean Emilia Zankina, that has worked with this publication. And then we will enter in our program and we will have a good discussion with the introduction by the director for the Institute of Christian Asia. And also we will, and this will be the first part, and we will have the professors and scholars explaining uh, into details the different regional perspectives, looking at Latin America and uh, different countries, also including in Africa as well, and uh, North America too. Also, we will have, between the second part, we have the opportunity to hear directly from the leaders in Asia, and they will tell us more about what's being done between women in politics. And we will later on open our Q&A session from the audience. So please have your questions ready and we will have towards, uh, towards the end, around 4.25, we will have our closing remarks. Right now, I'm gonna give the, the words over to our Dean, um, Dean Amelia Zakino. Thank you so much, Benedicta. Uh, my name is Emilia Zankina. I'm the Dean of Temple Rome, but more importantly, I'm a scholar of gender and politics and have been part uh, of this project. I'm really proud. This is the second edition of the book uh, that just came out this January. Uh, and I do hope that in a few years, we'll be updating the data as the trends, at least in the region that I covered for the book, Eastern Europe are very, very positive. Uh, I would like to thank the Conrad Adenauer Foundation for this amazing opportunity, uh, not only to produce this publication, but for all the work that is done uh, 
in all parts of the world to promote women leadership. We do know that women uh, benefit politics greatly. We do know that policy is better, corruption decreases, and uh, we have a much, much more balanced uh, political dialogue when we have more women. Aside from the fact that women constitute half of the world's population and should therefore be represented in power positions as well. Uh, I'm also very honored to have my distinguished colleagues who worked on this uh, uh, book project and, and whom we know each other from various conferences. Uh, I can assure you that those are the top scholars in the field. So we are really getting to hear from the best and the brightest uh, on this very, very important topic. Uh, special thanks to uh, Christian Ashley uh, for uh, making this possible and for Mega. Uh, for organizing it. It is a true pleasure uh, to be working with you and I look forward to many uh, more initiatives together. With no further ado, I would like to pass uh, the word on to Christian. Thank you so much, Dr. Emilia Sankina. And a warm welcome also from the side of Konrad Adenauer Foundation and its Political Dialogue Asia, which is based in Singapore where it's already quite late in the evening, but we are really, really delighted to be able uh, to speak to students, to scholars in, in Europe, in Italy, um, about this book project uh, of ours. And I think between the introduction of Benedicta Jumpa and the input of Dr. Emilia Sankina, you already heard where the issues are, right? I mean, uh, women in politics are still not present enough the presentation is not good enough and that results in our belief in the fact that women are disadvantages in different areas of life and yes COVID-19 I think put a big highlight on that um, especially the situation of women and that there was not enough done uh, in order to to deal with the impact of the pandemic on women but at the same time we do see that things are getting slowly better when we look into the different parliaments and this is what led us to the book project. So in 2015, we published this. Ah, yeah, now we have a problem with the background. Now, now it's better. We published uh, this um, first edition of Women Policy and Political Leadership. And even if we are based in Asia, we decided to have a look around the globe because we believe that in this area, we can really learn from different situations, different insights into different parts um, of the world. And then uh, last year, during the pandemic, we decided to do the second edition, um, which you can see here with updated information. Um, and again, we were able, we, were, we are very happy about that, to bring together the wonderful scholars. Some of you will talk to you today about their findings and their insights from their different regions. So yes, the book um, uh, includes a big update on all the numbers, all the statistics, but also on the analysis. Um, and I will share a screen in a moment, which will enable you to download it. But what is very important for me is to say that even if we see that we make some progress in some regions, the overall picture is still not good enough. We are still far away from having enough women in responsible positions. And I think some of the findings that we see here in Asia, but are also true for other parts of the world, is that women are moved into political committees which are not which don't seem so important, so relevant. So they, they are often not involved in the hard political topics of finance, security, but they're rather in committees uh, that deal with questions of family or sports. So I think this is uh, one thing that has to change. Uh, we also see in general that in, in some parliaments, the atmosphere for women is not very friendly. So uh, through our interactions with, with parliamentarians in the region, um, we know that they often have to deal with a very hostile environment um, if they make it to, to parliament. Um, so the, I think this is, is another point where, where we have to have a closer look. And because of that, we decided to create a network um, for female parliamentarians in Asia, AWPC. Uh, you can see the logo up here. And this is something that we do for five years now, or six years, and it's very closely connected um, to this book project. So what we kind of see in a research-based um, output in the book project is something that we try to synchronize 
with the discussions that we have with female parliamentarians. And in addition to that, we have a project which is called the Konrad Adenauer School for Young Politicians, where we identify 20 to 25 young politicians in Asia every year, promising young politicians. We try to make sure that we have at least 50% women um, in every batch. And um, they are, I think, drivers of change in, in many aspects. And I'm really, really happy that four of our CASIP alumni, who are now members of the Asian Democratic Leaders Alliance, are with us tonight. So I'm looking very much forward to both the presentations of our scholars, but also the insights and sharings of our yeah, politicians, our young politicians. And um, in order not to take too much time away from these sharings, these insights, and these discussions, I would now like to share the screen, which will enable you to download the second edition of Women, Policy, and Political Leadership. If you happen to have a smartphone in your hand, please uh, direct it to the QR code, and this will then enable you to download the digital version of this book. If you are interested in getting a hard copy, please let us know. And we are also happy to send you a few of the physical books of the hard copies um, if you want to have them, share them, work with them. So thank you so much uh, for being with us tonight. And back to Emilia, whom I would like to thank very much for this wonderful cooperation, Emilia and her whole team, uh, Benedicta, um, Emily, so really, really great to have this opportunity today. Thank you so much and back to you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you so much. Uh, Benedicta is our uh, coordinator and mediator today, uh, so I'll leave it to her. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Uh, Azure, Ellen Owens, Emilia Zankina. So today we have the honor of having scholars to discuss the regional perspective regarding gender equality and uh, political leadership. So we have today with us uh, Dr. Farida Jalalzai. Uh, she's associate pro uh, professor, uh, associate dean for global initiatives and engagement at the College of Liberal Arts of Virginia Tech. And later, we will add Jennifer uh, Miss Biscopo, and she will discuss with us about Latin America. She's Associate Professor of Politics and uh, uh, Affiliated Faculty for Latino and Latin American Studies at the, college, at the uh, Occidental College of Los Angeles. And later, we will also hear about Africa from Yolanda Sade, uh, Professor Emeritus at the Pol of Politics of University of Johannesburg. So I'll give the words over to Dr. Uh, Dr. Farida Jalotai. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm very happy to be included in today's talk in the edited collection. So my chapter focuses on women in their legislative representation in North America. So I analyze Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And what I'll do is just offer you a brief synopsis of trends and also try to weigh in on why it's important to have more women at the political table. So Mexico compared to the other countries that I'm studying definitely has the highest level of women in the national legislature. In fact, they almost have um, parity. If you look at their percentages, women have 48% of seats in the Chamber of Deputies and 49% of the seats in the Senate. And some of the explanations for this do focus on institutional factors. And so there are uh, in Mexico a combination of both single member districts and PR seats in each of the chambers. But probably most importantly is the quota that was instituted and then strengthened. So in 2003, and then after a series of reforms, including a constitutional measure that was adopted in 2014, it strengthened a quota mandate for women and strengthened the enforcement mechanisms and also required women to be in positions that would be in winnable districts as well. And so one of the things that my colleagues study a great deal is not just the inclusion of a quota, but whether or not the quota itself has enforcement mechanisms that are strong enough 
to actually make a difference. And if we look to um, the, our neighbors in the north, we'll actually see not as much progress. And so currently 27% of the seats in the House of Commons in Canada are held by women and 49% of the seats in the Senate are. Um, but at the same time in the Senate, we're looking at an institution that's not popularly elected, but appointed and is by comparison to the House of Commons much weaker. And so the other things that many of the scholars here today study is to what extent are those in positions of power truly empowered to, to make much um, change and how much influence do they have? And Canada only has quotas at the party level, not, at a, not in a, a national law or um, constitutional mechanism doesn't exist and utilizes single member districts, which are considered to be the worst for enhancing women's representation. And then if we look at the country that I'm, I'm representing um, today, the United States, we haven't seen a whole lot of change, honestly, in the US as of late, 23% of the House and 25% of the Senate um, is comprised of women. And we know very well that part of the explanation for this is our political institutions don't really facilitate women's inclusion. So the use of single member districts and a complete lack of quotas, which will not change anytime soon, if ever. And, and so one of the things, one, one of the things that we try to grapple with is beyond institutions, do we have evidence that maybe there's a discriminatory public, for example? And a lot of the literature tends to downplay that as an explanation and say, you know, it's only if more women would come forward and run, then we would have parity. But we also know that there's a lot of gender treatment in sexism that women are anticipating, rightfully so. And some of the research that has been published recently has really provided the evidence that women have to work twice as, as long, for example, to secure the same funding as their male counterparts. And so that's hardly gender parity. So we know that women have to, to walk a delicate um, walk to try to, to have parity. And that there's a lot of, I think, to one of the points on the next screen, a lot of focus instead on fixing institutions and recruiting more women, a lot more of the onus that's placed on women should just, just include themselves and do the training that they need to be, to be viable contenders. And so I think overall, we do see more evidence um, about the ex institutional explanations to account for women's levels in the legislature. The structural factors are a bit less conclusive, um, but women's presence in politics matters. And if we're talking about sending positive messages about women belonging in the political sphere, increasing the interest that men and women have in politics and participation. And when we look at the policy interests of women, even after controlling for other relevant factors such as party, we do see some evidence that women try to empower women, other women with what they're doing in terms of their legislative, um, their legislative agenda. So thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you so much to Dr. John Tsai. Okay, and now we have Dr. Gen uh, Dr. Jennifer Piscopo, she's the associate, pro associate professor for, uh, of politics and affiliated faculty uh, from the Occidental College of Los Angeles. Dr. Jennifer? Good morning um, from Los Angeles. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of women's representation in Latin America. There we go. Um, so um, just to go very briefly back in time, uh, Lat the countries in Spanish and Portuguese speaking Latin America democratized in about the 1980s. Different countries democratized at different moments for different reasons, but overall there was a wave of democratization that swept Latin America in about the 1980s. And women played significant roles in these pro-democracy movements. They were part of the human rights movements that challenged dictators. They were part of the peace movements that urged an end to civil war. 
But in the return to what we call politics as usual, so the return to electoral politics or party dominated politics, many of the women activists found themselves excluded from the founding democratic elections. And only about 5% of women were elected in the country's first elections following the transition to democracy. And this was a very disappointing result for reasons of justice, but also given the prominent role that women had played in democratic transitions. And so across the region, we saw women in civil society and in political parties um, demanding that uh, gender quota laws be adopted to protect their access to candidacies. So Argentina was actually the first country in the world, not just in Latin America, but in the world to adopt a 30% quota for women candidates in 1991. Uh, the rest of Latin America followed. And so today in 2021, uh, every Spanish or Portuguese speaking country in Latin America, save Venezuela and Guatemala has some form of a gender quota law for women candidates. And so you can see that, that, that these quotas have dramatically raised the proportion of women in Latin America's lower or unicameral chambers from about 9% in 1990 to about 30% today. Um, 10 of these gender quota laws are actually gender parity laws, meaning the political parties must run 50% men and 50% women. You just heard Professor Jalal Zai, for instance, speak about the case of Mexico. And I want to add that not only has Mexico achieved a gender parity legislature, but the recent gender parity reform to Mexico's constitution in 2019 required gender parity not just for the legislative races in the state, in the cities, the states, and the federal government, but also for the executive and judicial branches at the federal, state, and municipal level. So in some cases, gender parity is quite comprehensive. And then Nicaragua, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Costa Rica join Mexico in having gender parity or near gender parity legislatures. One result of the increasing number of women in Latin America's parliaments has been uh, the normalization of women's political power. So the region also elected five women presidents between 1999 and 2016. You see here Maria Moscoso in Panama, Michelle Bachelet in Chile, Cristina Fernandez in Argentina, Laura Chinchilla in Costa Rica, and Dilma Rousseff in Brazil. So at the moment, um, we could think about Latin America going forwards, but I'm also going to add an, uh, a note of caution related to backwards. So in terms of continued forward progress, if we look at the, at the cabinet level up around the region, there's about 30% women in cabinet, and there are some countries that have 40% or even gender parity cabinets, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Mexico. And I want to add that it's not necessarily the countries with gender parity legislatures that always have gender parity cabinets. Nicaragua, Mexico, and Costa Rica have parity in both places, but Colombia is very much an outlier. On the positive side, we, we see an increasing trend um, towards women occupying the hard or the more prestigious cabinet portfolios of say security, defense, justice, and the economy. And I noted that this was particularly the case when there were few women in cabinet, there was likely to be at least one woman holding one of these hard or prestigious portfolios. But right now there's actually a dearth of women that are no, in the presidency. There are no women who occupy the presidency in Latin America. And even though about half of the Latin American countries will hold presidential elections in 2021, uh, we don't see that many strong women poised to seize the presidency. And one reason might be um, a broader right turn in the region. Now, women can certainly be right-leaning, and we, there are cases of right women being presidents and prime ministers historically. Um, but in Latin America, this right turn, especially a right turn that is populist bent, seems to be um, making it more difficult for women to attain the presidency. Some policy gains related from the overall um, importance and presence of women in Latin America's parliaments, you see these strong protections for women's political rights. So once a few women um, enter office, thanks to gender quotas, they work to make those gender quotas stronger. Mexico being an excellent example of that process. It took about 20 years, but they got there. Um, you also see stronger violence against women laws. And I want to add um, a trend that's happening right now is we see a lot of movement from women parliamentarians in Latin America 
to frame um, protection measures, economic recovery measures related to COVID-19 in terms of building back better, in terms of making these measures more feminist, more gender, gender sensitive, and really thinking about mainstreaming gender into all of the country's COVID-19 uh, protection efforts. And I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. But just to wrap up, what are three ways that women in parliament can work to strengthen their policy power? First, I want to highlight the importance within the parliament or the legislature of having committees that are dedicated to women and gender issues. These would be review committees, so committees that can actually participate in the review, the redaction, and the passage of legislation. And then the importance of having women's caucuses, which are ways that women can build bridges across party lines, work on professional development issues, and also work on policy issues. And I put here an example of the Women's Secretariat within the, cam the Chamber of Deputies, the lower house of Brazil's Congress. Second, it's so important um, that women parliamentarians forge networks and partnerships with women activists and women leaders in civil society. Here I put the example of uh, the group Women as Plural, Mujeres en Plural in Mexico, which has done an enormous amount of work in the past 10 years to strengthen quota laws. And many of these networks now are transitioning to work on COVID-19 response and recovery. And then finally, an innovation from Latin America, these policy observatories. Um, here you see an example from Ecuador of the Observatory of the Law to Eradicate Violence Against Women. And these policy observatories are forms of networks and partnerships, but that work particularly on monitoring the state in its implementation of women's rights legislation, in this case, legislation to prevent violence against women. These three strategies are really important because they help women cooperate and they help women cooperate in a regular manner over time. And that gives visibility, legitimacy, and influence to women and to the policy issues that women are raising. So thank you so much. Um, please feel free to reach out to me on social media. And it was uh, my pleasure to join you today. Thank you so much, Professor Piscopo. You gave us absolutely the opportunity as well to get up with Professor John Tsai to learn about different regional perspectives, which I found is so insightful. I'm sure our students and uh, our guests are also find it insightful. insightful. Oh, now I give it over to Professor Yolanda Sadi, Emeritus Professor of University of Johannesburg in South Africa. Talk about gender issues related to Africa. Good afternoon. Um, well, I must say good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everybody. Uh, it's very nice being here with you, and uh, I will just give you a brief overview of. Um, the situation in Africa consisting of 55 African states that belong to the African Union. Um, so let me start by just looking at the, um, I must just reset here. Uh, right, I will want to start with by looking at the increase over the past 25 years. And I just want to say that um, the international protocols, protocols and instruments that we have across the world or the international ones also resonate, resonated on the African continent and also at sub-regional le level. We have the protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and the Pro Rights of Women in Africa. And only three African states have not rat ratified or signed this, this uh, protocol, which of course is legally binding. And that is Botswana, Egypt and Morocco. And then, for example, also at sub-regional level, we have in the SADC, the Southern African Development Community, we have the uh, uh, SADC Protocol on Gender and Development adopted in 2008, which actually states that by 2015, all uh, women, 50% uh, of women in decision-making, um, uh, uh, there should be 50% of women in decision-making uh, positions by 2015. Of course, this doesn't happen. But um, so the progress in the 25 years have been very slow. Um, if we look there, um, in, especially in the sub-Saharan countries, 
the highest um, the progress is in sub-Saharan Africa is a mere from 9.8% in the past 25 years to 24.7%. The highest increase is, of course, in, in this period is in Rwanda, 25 years ago, 4.3% to 61.3% currently. Then Senegal also, um, and then also if we, if, um, Senegal also uh, from 11.7 to 43 percent, Namibia from 18 to 42 percent, for nearly 43 percent, South Africa 25 to 46.4 percent. Then on the other hand, you have the least increases. Botswana in 25 years, only 0.8 percent increase in, in, in parliament, uh, rep parliamentary representation. Ghana 8 to 13 percent and Cote d'Ivoire 8 to 12 percent. But let's look at the achievements. There are some other achievements also, and also the lack of progress. We also have not as many as in Latin America, but we also had one head of state, um, uh, head of government, and that is Ellen Joseph Sirleaf of Liberia, who was president, executive president for two terms from 2005 up till the end of 2000, up until 2017. Um, we also had Joyce Banda in Malawi. She was appointed after the death of her predecessor in 2012. Unfortunately, she didn't win the next elections. But um, and then we also have, uh, I think what, that was quite telling in Africa was the appointment of Dr. Kozazan and Lamini Zuma as the first chair in 49 years of the African Union, uh, which was quite an achievement. She's from South Africa. And then we also have in Africa a number of heads of state, um, the nominal heads of state uh, with nominal powers, uh, ceremonial powers, the uh, president of Mar uh, Mauritius uh, at some stage, uh, Gurib Fakim, uh, 2015, and the current president of Ethiopia, uh, uh, Saleh Wokzwede is also a um, uh, uh, ceremonial president. Um, if we look at the, the importance of women in decision-making positions has clearly been seen with, in the case of Liberia, when uh, uh, Sirli, when she was president, she appointed numerous women in cabinet positions and other very important positions in the state. But her successor, um, only appointed two women in, Canada, in, in, in cabinet. And in the 2017 elections, all the achievements uh, or, or everything she did, um, if you look at the 2017 elections, there were 22 candidates standing for president or running for president, only one woman. And the, pre and the um, party that nominated Sirli for presidency didn't nominate a single woman this time around. So, um, so this is quite, uh, these are quite the, uh, the problems then. Um, if one looks at the, uh, uh, the women, uh, the leaders, the representation in parliament, Rwanda currently has the, the largest in Africa, 61% of them in the, uh, in the legislature. Um, South Africa, 46,6%, Senegal, 43%, Namibia, 43%, and Mozambique, also 41%. But and in 50% of African states, the women's representation is below 20%, which is, of course, um, not very good. Um, Women in cabinet positions um, are even worse, uh, but only 11 states have reached 30, the 30% 30 mark, while only in South Africa and in Rwanda, parity has been achieved in cabinet. Um, what we also found, what I've also found in Africa is that some countries with low parliamentary representation, less than 15% compensated with ministerial appointments, over 30% ministerial uh, uh, appointments. For example, in Mali, Mauritania, and Zambia, they went over 30% uh, while also having, while having less than 15% of women in parliaments. Then if uh, I want to turn to the gender quotas, 
more than half of the African states, 28 of them, use some form of quota. Um, the, the types of co quota are, are the legislative, legislated co candidate quotas or the reserved quotas. And then 10 of these 28 also have voluntary party quotas. Um, of course, if one looks at the problems with this, if I look at the voluntary party quota problems with them, is that when it's normally the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the ruling parties that have a, have a zebra style or a 50% representation on their party list, in other words, every second uh, person on their list must be a woman, uh, and that works very well, but the moment, and we found that in Namibia and South Africa currently, the moment that the liberation parties, the ex-liberation parties lose support, they also lose support in terms, of, in terms of women's representation, because the opposition parties do not necessarily follow a 50% quota on, on their party lists. So that is a problem with the voluntary party quotas, is that if the, the, if the ruling party loses, uh, started losing support, then the women's representation also go, goes down. Other problems experienced uh, with quotas um, here is that um, in, uh, it is argued that the special seats, for example, people, MPs on, in special seats are looked down upon. For example, in Uganda, it's been uh, reported, Tanzania, uh, for example, women in parliament are, uh, are not treated the same. In Tanzania, for example, women in constituency seats um, uh, are more easily appointed to higher level positions than those that came in in, uh, 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 in at um, uh, uh, reserved seat uh, or special seat. Uh, and then we found that the number of women switching over to open seats over the years have been very small. In Zimbabwe, the quota system also is also stigmatized. Women's participation is viewed as a token or a privilege granted by men. Also, the reserve system ghettoize uh, quota MPs. Um, the constitutional seats are seen as the seats for men, while the quota seats are seen as, as, as seats for women. So that is some, some problem. Um, what keeps the women out in, of politics in Africa? And I think the single major barrier is the deep, deeply rooted cultural, re religious, and traditional stereotypes around the role of women in society. And then, of course, secondly, the lack of political will from governments, despite the fact that the most of these states are signatories to all these international and continental uh, protocols, little has been doing in domesticating uh, these commitments. And also, I think what is the most important is even in states where they have legislative quotas or candidate code quotas, um, they're not adhered to and there are no sanctions for non-compliance which is a big problem and then um thirdly political parties are the most serious obstructors because they're the gateway for women's successful participation party leadership all uh, is considered uh, uh or is is, is is controlled by men and it's difficult for women to get into the party hierarchies where decisions are taken. And, and parties do not facilitate women's uh, uh, or help women to get into in, uh, or anything uh, like that. They, they, it's, it's sort of a very closed or, uh, uh, community. Then often, uh, furthermore, women often lack the necessary financial resources. Um, which limits their uh, capacity. For example, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, they have to pay very, very high uh, uh, fees to be able to stand, nomination fees to be able to stand as candidate. Candidates, for example, in Nigeria, and, and these are not rich countries in Nigeria, um, to be uh, to to be able to stand as a candidate or to be nominated as a candidate, they have to pay either around between two thousand three hundred dollar uh, and thirteen thousand dollar 
dependent on the level of representation. That is a lot of money and people just don't, women don't have that sort of money. Um, and, and the same goes for, for, for Ghana and, and, and Kenya, for example. Then I think a last barrier, a further barrier is also the electoral systems. Um, the first pass, the post system in particular, is, is, not, uh, is not very conducive. And um, especially um, um, in countries, we can see in countries where, where they have the least, uh, uh, the least, uh, uh, the smallest proportion of women's representation, like Ghana, Nigeria, Botswana, 13% Ghana, Nigeria, 3%, Botswana, 10%, they have first past the post systems. Um, so that is really a big problem also there. Then we can see that increasing violence also uh, against women restricts their political activities or deters them from sta standing. And this, this because spe specifically in the first past the post system, it's a do or die affair and violence is quite uh, 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 prominent there. Increasing verbal and physical abuse a woman uh, um, uh, uh, experience, uh, and that has been reported co uh, uh, constantly over the, in the elections in Ghana, Uganda, Tanzania, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and, and, and Zambia. So women just don't want to stand for because of the abusive uh, nature of politics uh, towards them. Then a manifestation of the patriarchal nature of most African countries is that women candidates are far less vi visible in election related media coverage. Um, gender stereotypes and stigmatization characterize the coverage of female candidates. And then lastly, one can ask, although numbers of women in decision making um, are still very important, one has to focus also on their substantive or um, uh, representation. In other words, what impact have they made on policy making and legislative diversity? And if one looks at the diversity, there's been a change of face, of course, in parliamentary uh, structures, in parliamentary committees, for example. Uh, the committees are chaired by women and not only the committees that, that are concerned with sport and children and women and that sort of thing, but also security, foreign affairs. Uh, the more, the more uh, uh, regarded as more important or uh, prestigious uh, uh, committees. Then also the uh, the parliamentary culture has changed tremendously, and that's been reported in Tanzania, Uganda, and South Africa. Uh, hours of uh, many things have changed in Parliament. Then, if, if one looks at the um, at the advocacy and the adoption of new laws, um, in Tanz many new laws have been amended. For example, in Tanzania, the Labour Act, Sexual Offences Act, Employment Act, because of women's input. Also, in uh, Uganda, legislating in terms of domestic violence, rape, female gen genital mutilation. And in South Africa, of course, it's well known the recognition that the recognition of customary marriages, um, the South African Domestic Violence Act, the choice of terminants. Termination of Pregnancy Act and many more can be attributed to female representatives in Parliament. But unfortunately, politics still re re remain a rather hostile terrain for many women in many countries in Africa. I think legislated quotas seem to be the only practical way of increasing the, the number of women in decision making positions, particularly in strong patriar patriarchal societies. And I, I think, but above all, it requires the commitment of government leaders. And without that, I don't think we will get, uh, we'll have a, a very rapid increase in the next few years if, if government leaders are not committed. Thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Yamanda Sadi. That was also very insightful. Thank you so much for opening like our eyes to the different like realities that we see in the African continent. 
So right now we move to the second part of our event and we do the discussion with the parliamentarians from uh, Asia and that session will be coordinated by Ms. Megan Sarma and she is the program manager uh, for the regional program uh, for uh, political dialogue in Asia. So right now we'll watch a brief video and we'll get into the discussion. Let me just directly first speak to the women in this workshop aspiring to positions of leadership or aspiring to um, work in public office or in politics. I know it's difficult. I've been there. I've been at the starting position. I know how difficult it is. You might face financial obstacles. You will face public shaming. You will face name calling. And very often, all this name calling, all these insults will be gender based. You might lack family support. You're very likely to face political violence. In the case of Maldives, um, you might face even state sponsored political violence. You might face legal persecution. You might and you're very likely to face backlash from religious extremists, depending on where you're from. And it might, I know in fact that it will feel like public office is an added responsibility. You cannot add on to the already existing responsibilities in the home and in your communities that you might already carry. You might have had a try before and not succeeded. But I want to say, keep in mind why you wanted to go into this in the first place keep that focus and remember that your community that your community and your country and your societies and your parliaments and the workplaces they need honest strong capable and willing women you need to do it because if you don't do it who will I want to discuss a little bit about how we can break barriers that we face. We all agree that we face many barriers. How can those of us in leadership positions, how can we help those aspiring? What we need to do, I think all of us, what we need to do is continue speaking up. We need to continue raising our voices. We need to continue to advocate for le legislative changes, for policy changes, for changes in how our parties choose candidates how we fund candidates we need to advocate for better environment uh, environment for women we need to advocate for better party frameworks we need to remain involved in affecting and advocating for these changes that we want we need to continue to educate our male colleagues we need to enlist enlist them as our partners and we have to keep out keep on calling out everyday sexism wherever we find it, because we need to make our workplaces and our communities a safe environment for women to work in. Uh, thank you so much, Benedicta. It is my pleasure to have the video. This video was uh, uh, Miss uh, the parliament honorable parliamentarian uh, eva abdullah spoke about about in this video in our workshop and we launched the book in january and today we have with us four bright uh, young uh, young politicians from asia who are part of the asian democratic leaders alliance which is an alliance of leaders and organizations in asia that share a common interest in making democracy work for the people in their respective countries and in the region in general the organization aims to advance and consolidate democracy in Asia through a community of responsible and accountable civic business and political leaders, a learning and engagement platform on accountable civic business and sustainable development, an inclusive network of organizations and groups that promote democratic leadership and governance. Today we have with us four young leaders. First, we have Ms. Hijratul Magfora Abdullah, Secretary of International Relations, National Awakening Party of Indonesia. Barrister Shah Ali Farad, Special Assistant to the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh. We have Ms. Dobigeral Kuyag, Member of National Policy Committee, Democratic Party of Mongolia. And we have with us Mr. Yonghee Oh, Advisor of the National Unification Council's People's Party. 
as well as the leader of the international relations team, People's Power Party, South Korea. So to these four people, I'll be asking a few questions and I'll be asking one question and we'll have a round with all the four. So my first question to the panelists is, what are the gender dynamics in your country and what is the percentage of women in positions of power? I would like to start with Firo. Firo, please start. Thank you, Maga. Oh, I'm very nervous, but I'm very happy to uh, meet you all, uh, Mega Sarma and then uh, Christian and uh, the distinguished speaker. So uh, without spending much time, I, I just want to respond what uh, Maga um, questions. So in Indonesian context, uh, we have uh, Indonesia has adopted a 30% quota uh, for women uh, in uh, the House representative. The adoption of a 30% quota has not been able to reach 30% women's representation in parliament, even though political parties already uh, follow the quota rules. But uh, despite the inability to reach the targeted quota, uh, there has been uh, an increase in women participation in this uh, year, in this period of election. Uh, so in uh, 2000. Uh, 19 election, women uh, representation has increased, reaching more than uh, 20 percent. Because previously, only uh, like uh, 17 and 18 uh, percent of uh, women representative. So yeah, it's uh, the dynamic of uh, women representative in my country in Indonesia. So yeah, that's all. <laughs> so maybe just uh, pass to another panelist. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Farhat, can I ask you to come in? Yes, can you see me? Yes, hello. Hi. So the same question applies to me? Yes, please. All right. So um, thank you, Meha. Thank you, everyone at the Conrad Adenauer uh, Foundation. Of course, uh, the uh, other organizers, organizers from the Temple University in Rome. Uh, my greetings to my fellow uh, Asian Democratic leaders, uh, panelists, and of course the distinguished speakers from whom we have learned so much about the other regions of the world. Uh, starting off with um, the general gender uh, situation in Bangladesh. So uh, if we take the 2020 gender gap index by the World Economic Forum, um, Bangladesh has closed over 72% of its gender gap generally, which makes it uh, number one in gender gap reduction in South Asia and number 50 among the 153 countries which, have, which are being studied under this index. Um, women in positions of uh, policy and political decision-making in Bangladesh. So let us start off with the highest positions in the land, uh, Bangladesh for uh, this, its 50 year history. Uh, has been directly governed by a head of government who has been female for more than 22 years now. And if you uh, leave out the uh, military juntas, then for the 94% of its democratic uh, governance system, it has been um, governed by a female head of government. Right now, we have a, uh, the leader of the house and the speaker of the house are both female. Uh, in the last parliament, uh, even the leader of the opposition was female. So over the past 50 years, the position of women in political and policy-making roles in Bangladesh has increased. Um, so when we started off uh, in the year of our independence, 1971, right after that, we formulated our first constitution in which the reserved seats for women was first in introduced. Uh, at that time, it was 15 seats in parliament reserved for women. And the general seats were, of course, 300, and women were free to uh, contest in those elections. It has now come to the position where we have 50 reserved seats in parliament for women and 300 general seats, of course. Among the general seats uh, in the current parliament, we have 22 elected female member of parliaments, which takes the total number of female member of parliaments to um, 72. Uh, right now, we have that means around 20% of our MPs are women. And in the cabinet, uh, including the prime minister, we have 8% women's representation in cabinet, which is not, of course, um, 
desirable. We would like to see more uh, women in our cabinet. Now, on the policy level, uh, I'd also like to point out that apart from the general very political positions that we usually talk about, which is the parliament, the cabinet, etc., Bangladesh has had a very significant increase in the number of women in local government elections, which we consider to be quite crucial uh, to democratic decision making and political leadership. So um, in Bangladesh, you have the system whereby the Upuzela, which is the sub district, is considered to be the key uh, local government unit. And in those uh, elections, in the Upuzela elections, the local government election, there are two vice presidents and one of them has to be a woman. So it's a reserved women's directly elected uh, vice president seat. So if you take that into consideration, there are more than 12,000 12, female representatives who are directly elected at the local level. And if you then um, add up the, uh, the women leaders who also contested the other seats, then we have more than 12,800 women who are currently in local government positions. Um, this was introduced for the first time in 1997 when the current Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina uh, came to power as the Prime Minister of Bangladesh for the first time. Uh, apart from that, um, we have had a, a significant increase in the number of women in key administrative posts, which I consider to be as important as having um, female representation in parliament and political roles, because the administrative, the civil bureaucracy hold a lot of influence, especially on the local levels, especially on uh, gender and other issues. So it is good that we have a lot of women there. So uh, currently uh, the highest, um, position in the Bangladeshi civil service is called a secretary and the second highest is the additional secretary. Currently we have six women secretaries and uh, 54 additional secretaries. We have women's representation in both divisions of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. So we have them in the high court division as well as in the appellate division. And the very important position of deputy commissioner who are uh, in charge of one district, Bangladesh has 64 districts, uh, we have a number of um, district commissioners who are uh, women, as well as we have now seven ambassadors, full ambassadors of Bangladesh, including um, someone who I know closely, who is now the first female ambassador of Bangladesh to the Middle Eastern region. Our female uh, ambassador, uh, Her Excellency, uh, is now posted in Jordan. And apart from that, in the university level, the public universities, the government positions, everywhere you have women uh, taking up leadership positions. For the first time in the year 2000, we allowed the government of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina for the first time allowed women to serve in the armed forces of Bangladesh. And just two years ago, we have had our first female major general in the Bangladesh army, which means that uh, it's the third highest uh, position in the armed forces. So we Women are now um, doing a, a lot of uh, leadership roles in the various services that you have of the Republic. In the government service, there is now a 10% quota for women and uh, for non-gadgeted posts, which are the non-permanent posts, you have a 15% quota. In the primary school education system, which is completely public in Bangladesh, you have a 60% quota for women. Now, these were generated, the snapshots of uh, the position of women in Bangladesh's um, policy making and political leadership positions. Just one last example to give you. Uh, I would like to highlight you to the corporate world because the people in the business community, they are also a very key component of the e entire policy making process, uh, not only in Bangladesh, but of course I would say in any, any other country. Uh, currently in Bangladesh, we have a study. I have just one study to uh, cite here. In 2018, we looked at the number of directors who were in the boards of public and private banks in Bangladesh. So we have 48 public and private banks in Bangladesh. Out of those uh, banks, um, we have 74 uh, corporate board members, directors, female uh, directors out of 618 uh, such positions. 
uh, which makes it around 12%, which is of course still uh, far from parity, but it is uh, actually quite um, more than most of our neighbors in South Asia. And in fact, a lot of our uh, neighbors in the uh, in generally the Asian region. Um, now, a lot of challenges of course exist. And uh, if I get the chance, I will talk to you about those challenges as well. Thank you, Mega. Thank you, Shah. I would now like to invite uh, Nomi Girl from Mongolia to share about the experience in Mongolia. You're muted. Hello, you're hearing me now? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you uh, for Conrad Adler Foundation and the uh, Temple University Rome and also professors for sharing your uh, great um, researches for us. And also thank you for the uh, opportunity to share Mongolian situation in this uh, great um, discussion. So for the first question, the status of gender equality in Mongolia is might be a bit uh, quite unique and complex. And according to the World Economic Forum's uh, gender gap report, Mongolia ranked 58 out of uh, 144 countries studied and the fifth among the other countries within the Asia Pacific region. To summarize the situation very shortly, the uh, general, uh, general gender equality situation, uh, women in Mongolia have higher education and lower unemployment rates than the men, but on average earn less than men and experience higher uh, rates of gender-based violence. And in terms of political representation, the Mongolia has unicameral parliament with uh, 76 seats and electoral system is first passed post the voting and the gender quota for the candidacy is just uh, only 20%. And currently the women occupy only uh, 13 seats at the parliament while men hold the remaining 63 um, seats, which means it's only 17% uh, percent in national parliament and it's, it's actually far from the global average of 25%. And this places uh, Mongolia um, bit uh, backwards in, in, in the, uh, comparing to other countries uh, in according to the IPO database. And the percentage of women in subnational level um, um, local assemblies, it's also at around um, 27%. And actually these numbers are success comparing to the previous results. And they, they have been um, never been a woman president, a uh, woman prime minister, and even the governors of provinces and the cities of the um, cities, uh, governors of the cities in Mongolia. And uh, but in mid level positions in both in public and private uh, sectors, we see almost equal representation of women and men. And uh, for me, the general trend seems that the decision making body, if the decision making body is a collective, the woman's share is increasing. But the, if the position is a uh, top position, it's usually disproportionately the male is prevailing. So thank you for, for now. And I'm going to share the, uh, the, the, the challenges um, afterwards. Thank you so much. Uh, Yonghee, yeah. could you share what South Korea, please? Uh, well, thank you for having me here today for Kunanana Foundation, as always. Um, I want to mention firstly about the, it's a shame that the upcoming by-election for uh, the capital Seoul and the second largest city Busan mayors will occur because of the former two mayors sexual harassment to their young women secretaries. Um, actually, the two former mayors are from the current ruling Democratic Party. So as an opposition party member, it is a shame. Um, first, I want to say about the symbol uh, it is, as you may know, the former president of Korea from my party was a woman. Uh, it's a symbol of a women's status in politics of Korea because, as you know, the U.S. has had no women president in her history. And second, I want to say about the reality. Um, among to the total 300 seats in the National Assembly, the Korea has the single house system and the number of the women members is 57, that is 19%. Among 57, uh, 29 members are from constituency, um, it is the 19% and 28 members are from the proportional, it is um, uh, about 60%. Um, according to the Korean law, political parties should nominate women proportional candidates at the odd numbers. 
my party the main opposition um, conservative people power party has 18 women members among total 102 members the percentage is 17.6 percent in the national assembly the ruling democratic party has 28 women members among the total 174 the percent is the six 16%, and that's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Younghee. Our next question is only for females. We do uh, we do uh, welcome the male perspective, but we have another question for you. But for the for the male, females in the panelists, I would like to ask you all, what are the challenges young women in politics like you face? And what are the steps being taken by the party or by, your, uh, by the society to help you overcome them? I would like to start with uh, Firo to share her experience. Okay, thank you, Mega. So according to my experience, so I, I also will uh, express my thank my credit to CAS because uh, after joining the uh, Young Leadership Program uh, in the CAS, so I have strengthened to express uh, my willing, uh, my um, way, willing and interest in the political um, career so uh so that yeah it is not easy but uh i should uh, you know i should uh, move uh, to uh, fight um in the uh, uh yeah political uh, situation so uh the challenge uh, especially in the indonesian context uh how the culture the tradition uh, the and also the selection of process of political parties and then the media and the organizational networks that influence women representation in politics. Uh, because in Indonesian uh, context, uh, organizational networks, it's uh, very important. So there is uh, especially uh, the uh, religious uh, organizational background. So fortunately, uh, besides I'm uh, joining uh, the politics, I'm also active. Before that, I'm also active in the uh, organize, uh, um, Muslim organization, the biggest Muslim organization in Indonesia. So I have, even though I have no uh, capital uh, resources of uh, or financial capital, but I have a social capital, social uh, resources. Uh, I'm very active in the Muslim uh, women, the biggest Muslim women organization in Indonesia. Uh, then uh, I, you know, I'm very active uh, using social media. Like I'm, uh, I got in the cast uh, material program, so I'm very active uh, using the social media and always, you know, mentioning the leader of party, my party leader, which is men, and you know when uh, the party will, you know, uh, will. Choose, uh, will um, how to uh, how to say uh, will choose uh, the member of national uh, board. Uh, I'm you know <laughs> it's a very funny. I just uh, direct message or DM via uh, his Instagram. <laughs> you know it's a so funny. Then I propose myself that I want to be a part of the uh, national board of the party. Then. Uh, lucky me, uh, he chose me as part of the you know national member. I'm the youngest uh, member uh, of the national member uh, national board member of my party, and then I'm also the beginning uh, in the uh, uh, political career. So yeah, how to overcome? Just like you know, uh, if you don't have any capital, any financial uh, capital or resources, uh, just uh, you know. Uh, mapping or just looking for uh, other resources like I'm active in the uh, previously in the uh, uh, NG local NGO and also international NGO and also active in uh, CSOs, uh, religious CSO, I'm active to promoting uh, women issues so uh, and then uh, just uh, show up to our uh, party member to our party leadership and using uh, social media it's free so I think yeah just perform uh, yourself as uh, what it is so i think it is uh, what i'm experiencing uh, how uh, i'm uh, actively uh, joining in the my uh, party i think that's all mega thank you so much uh, namigel please share your your challenges and how you have overcome them youtube unmute okay now 
Thank you. And um, uh, in Mongolia, the traditional patriarchal gender norms and uh, preference for men in leadership roles still uh, have a significant impact on the behavior of voters, political parties, and even for women themselves. And political party is, actually, is a major uh, channel for political engagement into the politics because of the electoral system. It, it's not easy to be independent or not easy to run as a third party you know, um, candidate. So it's usually the only two big parties uh, defines uh, who run for the election and who wins the seat. And, but in, in Mongolian case, but um, still the public perception of these two uh, big party and also overall politics is really critical and the and the uh, critical and public uh, general public regarded political party as one of the most corrupt institution in the country. And the last year poll showed that the young Mongolians have very little confidence in political parties. And another recent survey in Mongolia also revealed that the women's perception were more uh, were more pessimistic than the men about the political party. I think that this kind of perception may really hinder their willingness to involve the politics through the parties. And such perception that politics is dirty, it's a tough job, it's a man job, it's, it's a still very strong. And maybe uh, it's getting more stronger due to the harshness of cruel competition among politicians and ever increasing for, uh, money for, for the politics it requires. And for Mongolian ordinary women, in this situation, the however qualified may she uh, qualified uh, she may be, who have unbalanced burden of the care job in addition to her paid job, going into dirty politics with her own little money against very harsh public eye is big no no. And in this situation, these quotas and the spaces for women in politics tend to be captured by the women who have political elite backgrounds, and. Of, and there are many angles to overcome this kind of challenges. For me, in addition to this proactive recruitment and capacity buildings and perception changing efforts by the politic, political parties or the civil society, which we always do, forever do, <laughs> more stru structural changes must be done the foremost, such as changing this electoral system and elevating the gender quota from at least to 30% and renewing the decade old political party law uh, and introduce the gender, uh, gendered state uh, funding to the political parties and also uh, the requirement for the political parties to be transparent in terms of funding. That's all for now. Thank you so much. Uh, now to have more gender equality, I would like to ask the men on question to Yonghee and Farhad. Uh, what's the role of men in politics to ensure, uh, to ensure that women not only have access to position in politics, but are also fully heard? Farhad, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, see, one of the challenges uh, that I have seen uh, over the last eight years that I have been directly involved with political work in Bangladesh is that I have noticed two distinct stages when I have lost some of my uh, best female colleagues who started off with me. So one would be when they graduate from student politics to the next level. So that would be they are working locally, it would be local government elections, local politics, or if they are based in the capital city and would like to work nationally, so from student politics, to national politics. These, this is the stage where uh, we seem to be losing most of our bright female activists, because let me tell you, there is no shortage of uh, good female political workers and politicians, young politicians at the student and youth stage. But the, the, at the time of transitioning to the next level, I think that is where some of them are lost. And the, the second part would be, I guess, even if they graduate to national or local level politics from student politics, uh, whenever they are uh, trying to start a family, so after they, are, they get married or mostly when they, 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 uh, they have a baby, uh, that is when we seem to be losing uh, some of them. So uh, I, I guess from our perspective, what we must do is to make sure that there are avenues for them to continue working politically, even during those crucial stages in their lives, so that they are not completely out of touch. And then they are, when they're ready to come back and give uh, more time to politics, they are able to do so 
uh, without being completely detached from the process for a few years. So I, I guess that is where one area where uh, male politicians, male counterparts must stand besides their female comrades uh, in helping them. And the other one would be in Bangladesh, we have this um, uh, rule uh, under the representation of people's order, which is the uh, main electoral law in Bangladesh, under which every political party must ensure 33% uh, representation of women at all levels of the party, starting from the highest political decision-making body of the political party to the uh, lowest tier. So uh, that is where uh, most of the, most, not, not, not most, actually all of the political parties have failed in that uh, obligation. Uh, so uh, it ranges between 11% to 17% with Awami League, the party that I am a member of, uh, in the higher threshold. But even then, it, it's simply not enough. 33% is the minimum requirement stipulated by law, and we have failed in that. Uh, but from our, our party, we have already applied to extend the deadline beyond 2021 to ensure that we can fill up those positions. And I think this is where we must, as men, as uh, the male counterparts of our female comrades, must come together and make sure that in every level, we, we fill up that minimum requirement. That is the minimum that we can do, in my opinion. So off to you, Thank Mayra. You. Thank you, Farhad. I'd like to ask Young Hee to share his perspective with South Korea. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, powerful Korean male politicians have a tendency to want to have young women politicians uh, by the side to attract more support from voters. So most of women politicians' position is, for example, a spokesperson that has a career in an announcer or reporter. Uh, to overcome this tendency, the party has a program to foster women politicians in terms of supply, but it is hard to overcome that kind of demands. Uh, these demands make women politicians hard to survive in the politics in the long term. In this context, male politicians should consider female as an equal comp competitor, not a person who should give a benefit. Uh, surely to reach out the level, uh, kind of the additional points are needed in the process of the nomination in the party. Mm, according to the population structure changes, um, it will be more natural, especially in Korea, because uh, Korean population, uh, male is, uh, women is uh, bigger than, uh, more than the uh, um, males. That, that, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I'd really like to thank all the ADLA members for sharing their perspective. We are running out a little time, so I will not be asking the last question I've given you all, but thank you so much. It was really insightful, I'm sure, for the audience. And I would like to now hand it over back to Benedicta so that she can get the question from the audience. Thank you so much, Benedicta. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for your precious insight. I want to thank each representative who's been so, like, insightful and such a learning experience to hear from young politicians and how to navigate the challenges and the work that's been done in different countries and in the region of Asia. So we're opening up the Q&A session. Please, we have a Q&A box. Please submit your questions. Uh, as to some of our students and classes are connected, please uh, submit your questions because like, as we are in a, a webinar format, because we need you to submit your questions through the Q and A session, and uh, we have a few minutes, and uh, we will, like it's important, I believe as well. We have this honor to have scholars and politicians as well to hear from them. So please put any questions that you have uh, in the Q and A box that should you should be able to see. Uh, let's see, are you able to see the Q and A box? Let me ask you in the chat.
a few minutes to be able to submit the questions. Don't be shy, please write it down in the chat. Like it's, it's very important. Like, I think it's such a unique opportunity to be able to learn from scholars and politicians and see what we can do in the future. So please put your question in the chat. So while we're waiting for the questions, I actually have a question probably for the leaders. So as we're waiting for the question, please Please, please, please do put the question in the chat uh, or, in the, please, or the Q&A box or in the chat, please submit them so we are able to um, answer this question to the, politician, to the politicians and the scholars as well. So I guess this question would be mainly for the, um, for the politicians. Um, uh, my question would be like, do you think, like, I uh, heard a representative from Bangladesh saying the importance of, like, creating, like, initiatives to ensure that women at different stages of life, they're able to uh, engage between politics. So my question for the politician would probably be, like, how can we change um, the politics culture in a way that it is, like, can work for both men and women? Because even if we look at the, such as the times, the schedule for, even like male politicians, politics can be pretty stressful, like late hours in the office, and it's not always like a, a healthy, like work and life balance. So how can we ensure that we, um, we ensure that there is like actually not only like structural items for women to engage in politics, but to ensure that this is the normal practice between politics. Uh, is it an open question to all of us? Uh, it's an open question to all of you, um, but if you want to answer it, I'm like, yeah, I'm happy to hear from you. Yeah, uh, it's actually a very good question. How do you make at least some reasonable adjustments to accommodate the female colleagues? Uh, I think one of them being uh, this, uh, in the developing countries at least, in the LDCs and the developing countries. Uh, in the political culture, we have a lot of uh, uh, late night work. So uh, parliament usually starts in Bangladesh uh, around the evening. So it's um, around uh, say 5 p.m., 4 p.m. and then goes on till say 9.30, 10. So uh, colleagues who may be in parliament now, who may be young, who may have young children, that would be a very uh, difficult time indeed for them. And uh, so uh, probably the adjusting the timings of it would uh, go a long way to ensure that those who are at least interested to attend can attend. Thank you. So I see some questions in the chat. I think it's important to answer those. And if you have any other like answers to other questions, I see already Professor Yolanda Sadi, she's answering the question of Natalia Lugeri, who she's one of our students. And she asked, uh, how do you intend to work with and include other African countries between your work, especially with the fact of COVID-19 on African women working in domestic and uh, textile industry. So this comes from Marlena Rodriguez. So we have two part questions. So should, should I, I answer now? I was starting to you answer now. Please do, please do. Um, no, uh, I have a number. Uh, that's how we work in, in, in most of these African countries is that we have colleagues at other universities or uh, 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 women in NGOs that we work with. Um, and we've just started now with uh, looking at the effects of COVID-19 on, uh, in general, but the general effects, not specifically on domestic and textile industries, but we've just now started to launch, uh, to look at, at, the, at the number of countries where they had severe lockdowns, et cetera, and to see what the effect on, on women has, have been. 
but that goes through uh, uh, our colleagues or my colleagues at various universities that you know the networks that you build up over the years And I also have a, a number of networks at the French speaking universities, which is which is nice. So, you know, we look at the uh, uh, the the, um, the the English speaking as well as the French speaking uh, university. So it's, it's quite a, a large area that we cover. Thank you. And there was also a question regarding like textile industry and domestic industries, uh, uh, the effects of the COVID-19. Do you have more specific uh, examples by any chance, Professor Sadi? On? On? Uh, so the second part of the question was looking at the effects on African women working between the domestic and textile industries. Uh. No, I haven't at the moment, but what I've seen is that the most, the, 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 um, what they've done in South Africa so far, and that was general, that the people that lost their work was mostly uh, women that, that have lost their work, but that was in general, that was in, in, in the service division, catering, as well as, as everywhere where they lost work and where these uh, industries were closed. Um, it was women that, that, were, that were the first that lost these. But we have to now collate all the statistics and see how many of them. But these were general reports all over. But we're starting now to look at uh, you know, doing a proper scholarly study on this. OK, perfect. Thank you so much. So there is another question from Donna Perkis from Philadelphia. And uh, thanks so much for the speakers and for the se uh, session. My question is, if you personally do, don't want to run for a position, how best can one support other female politicians to be successful? Maybe the politicians want to take this question. So any of the scholars that have any insights on this? Can I answer this? Oh, yes, go for it. Okay, what I think what uh, one can do, and uh, I've done, especially as an academic, um, many of these women's associations or women running for parliament have actually um, uh, contacted us and, and then actually need to be the biggest problem that. that we find that women have this uncertainty. They don't know how to do things. They don't know how to speak, how to raise money, how to do that sort of thing. And we try and help them in that way or give ideas on, on how to uh, uh, address certain issues. And I think that helps very uh, a lot. I've done such uh, training courses in Z Zimbabwe and in Zambia uh, where women's organizations ask them, uh, and 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 one one tr and they have workshops where one can assist women on on questions and how to address questions and, and that sort of thing. I think that it's the empowerment role that's really very important. And I think we all can help to to facilitate some empowerment, even if we don't do it ourselves. We can arrange that other people can help women uh, to empower themselves and, and not be so uncertain of themselves. If I can jump in as well, um, I can offer some insights on the on the previous questions as well. But on the you know on the question of how to support women, I mean I think Professor Asadi is is completely right. But I, I want to stress that the reason why women might be uncertain or unknowledgeable about how to do politics is not because women are less good at politics. No. It's because no. when women are and, and that's not at all what you meant, Professor Asadi. But no. I want to sort of illuminate the point that the reason that women um, often need um, these kinds of trainings or these, um, sorry, the word in Spanish is capacitacion, right? These kinds of courses is because when women are traditionally excluded from networks, from the male dominated networks in political party, they're not kind of picking up in the atmosphere just how you do politics, not because they're not good at it, not because they can't learn, but because they're not in the party networks. And so it's often these civil society and these academic organizations that have to fill that training gap. 
So it's actually really important that the parties also take the responsibility um, for including women and making sure that women are getting socialized into politics. So I really want to underscore, for instance, some of the, the comments made by our honorable guest from Bangladesh about how the parties have to take this role on themselves. I think the other thing that you can do to support um, women candidates in your day-to-day -day life is actually talk about to talk about and challenge the attitudes that your friends and that your family have about women politicians that will keep them from voting and supporting those women politicians. Call out the sexist media treatment when you see it. You know, when a family member at dinner is saying inappropriate things about what a women politician looks like or sounds like, call it out, right? We can all do our own um, day to day to challenge the kind of the preconceptions that, that circulate about women in politics. Um, and I just wanted to add on the, the question of um, women and the, and the textile industry and job losses in heavily feminized sectors. Um, you know, I'm not working in the, in the African context, but I'm doing a lot of work uh, more generally with, with the United Nations on um, building back better and sort of having a gender sensitive and feminist COVID-19 recovery. And so there are a lot of organizations that are really paying attention to the heavily feminized job losses. And um, you know, in, in that even in, in some Asian countries where the economies actually have not been as hard hit under COVID, it's actually because surging demand for say electronics has bolstered employment in a male dominated sector and, and it's masked the job loss for women in, in textile industries, right? And so there's actually a lot of work that's being done on trying to repurpose um, these factories. So if they used to make prom dresses, now they make personal protective gear. And there's a lot of civil society organizations and the international labor organization is really paying close attention to this. So if this is something um, that students and others on the call are really interested in, I encourage you to reach out to groups on the ground because folks are really trying to address these challenges. Thank you so much to Professor, to Professor Piscopo and Professor Sadi as well for like educating different points and different perspectives, which I think is so helpful, especially about thinking about repurposing like industries during this time of COVID-19. So I see other questions. There are a couple of questions and we should, we should wrap up soon. Like, sorry about that, but it means like if the questions are coming through, it means that we had a good question and insightful question and insightful session that stimulated our participants. So definitely that's a good sign as well. So seriously, thank you so much for your time that you invested in us. So uh, the, the question here, so I saw one uh, for, uh, for Representative uh, Shana Lee. Uh, so the question coming from our student, Mamela Rodriguez, uh, she, uh, Rodriguez, she asked, uh, so we spoke about cooperating women, even with family obligation. Do you feel somehow this is related to the limited option for parent, maternal and parental leave? So are there options for maternal and parental leave between politics? Can I uh, have a go? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think this was, this was a very good question. Uh, I would really like to know, and I think this is where uh, Kaas uh, and both uh, Temple University can uh, have another session where we can uh, discuss the various best practices which have been adopted by some countries. Uh, but overall, I think the, the situation is, is not very good across the board, even, even in developed countries. So I remember this big scandal that came up uh, uh, about three years back in the UK, it was regarding a female MP uh, who was lactating at that time, who was uh, breastfeeding a child at that time, that there was no such uh, provision uh, to do so in the UK House of uh, Commons, which is uh, considered to be one of the most uh, progressive parliaments in the world. So uh, the, the same uh, applies for other countries as well. And uh, for the maternity leave, at least for Bangladesh, we can now say that in the last six years, uh, this is developing very rapidly in the public sector. We have a mandatory six months uh, maternity leave and under the law that we have, uh, even for private entities, it must be a minimum of three months. But I don't think uh, the political parties have yet um, incorporated uh, the issue of paternal and maternal leaves. As I said, that uh, it is generally expected that once a female 
uh, colleagues have a child, they would not be staying with us with us for much longer. And uh, this is, I think, where we must uh, focus our attention and uh, um, come up with uh, some sort of accommodation that the party uh, stipulates for its female members uh, as, a, as a matter of rule, not as a matter of like courtesy. Uh, and just one more point, I would like to thank uh, our previous speaker, Jennifer, for this very good suggestion that we must at all times be on the toes to call out sex sexist language in the media. I'll just give you one example. So the economist, uh, UK based economist is considered to be a very renowned publication, right? Whenever they uh, report on Bangladeshi politics, and I, I have no doubt, uh, shame in admitting that we do have a confrontational political culture, but whenever they do so, they talk about the battling Begums in Bangladesh. So the main opposition leader, uh, she's a uh, woman and the prime minister and her party, she's being led by a woman. So the fact that we have two women uh, in the two most prominent political parties, they kind of feel free to term it as the battle of the Begums or the battling Begums. So the last time they did it, I actually wrote to them and saying, you do not say that uh, in when two male politicians are competing with each other, even very confrontationally, you never uh, call them the two kings. In what sense are you calling them the two queens? So I, I think we have to be always ready to call out this kind of sexist language in the media as well. And that was a very good point made by Jennifer. I thank her for that. Thank you. Can I also just add to women in legislatures, uh, what we've done in South Africa, what they've done in the uh, provincial legislature, the Gauteng legislature here in Johannesburg, is that they do allow women, uh, the children of women, to come into the legislature in the afternoons. They they do allow them to sit there with their parents, with their mothers, etc. When the schools come out, and uh, uh, that sort of thing happens, and not everywhere, but they they have made that concession at the at the legislature in this province. Thank you so much. Like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. So uh, um, we have a few more questions. We try to wrap it up. So we, we take it these last few questions that we sent already. Uh, try to answer as briefly as possible so we can close uh, the, the, um, the event. So uh, probably this could be for the scholars. Uh, do you know how many countries, uh, from Donna Perk is from Philadelphia, you know how many countries at quarters will the US ever have the same? Who wants to take a seat, Jennifer Piscop, right? Those yeah, so, so I, yeah. I, I, I can talk about that. Um, so about um, half of the countries in the world have some form of gender quota law. So that either requires political parties um, to run certain numbers of candidates, which is what I described in Latin America, or there are seats that are reserved in the legislature uh, for women. And, and, and those are found in, in Africa in addition to the candidate quotas and in the Middle East and North Africa. So the thing about gender quotas is that they're actually found in every world region, right? They're found in developed and undeveloped countries. They're found in um, advanced industrialized democracies, democratic aspiring countries, and they're found across electoral systems. So they're not just in uh, countries where you vote by, where you vote for a candidate list that's presented by political parties, but quotas are also applied in the kind of first past the post single member district systems that you have in the United States. So for instance, Mexico, and I believe our colleague from Mongolia also mentioned that there they have electoral systems that work sort of like the US system, right? There's one candidate per district, and even there you can have a gender quota. The challenge in the US case, um, the US is really unique. If you've listened to the whole call, you've heard people talk about parties, political parties, political parties. So in most countries around the world, when somebody becomes a candidate and they actually become a candidate, they're on the election registry standing for office, it's because the political party has registered them with the election authorities. So it's easy to have quotas in this sense because the quota is actually a regulation on political parties that when political parties choose and then register their candidates, they have to fill that quota. The challenge is the uniqueness of the US context where political parties actually don't control who becomes a candidate. 
a candidate declares themselves as, say, a Democratic or Republican, and if that candidate gets enough signatures herself, she can go to the election authority and register herself and put herself on the ballot. So in a context where the political parties don't control candidate selection, which is the US context, it's very then difficult to have a quota because how would you, who is the enforcement, right? How do you enforce it, right? So the Democratic and Republican parties in the US do have some internal quotas where they do, in cases where they do control the selection of the individuals and that's for the party conventions. So for instance, the Democratic party requires that delegates to the Democratic convention, the delegates from each district fill a quota. So I think that our challenge in the United States is one that we have sort of a cultural um, baggage around the idea of quotas, which we could maybe talk about another time. And two, the technicalities of our election system are such that it would be difficult to force the parties um, to nominate women when we, parties really don't control who becomes a candidate. Okay, thank you so much for this very clear like answer. So we really last two questions just to quickly brief uh, to wrap up. I believe this question is for the parliamentarians, but if the person asked uh, ask, ask the question, I would like to clarify that, although it's anonymous. The question was asked, was there a defining moment in your life that made you want to go into this type of field? Does anyone want to share like a defining moment that you go into this field regarding like politics, I believe, but also I believe gender studies between politics as well. I assume this is for the politicians, but I'm sure this could be also for the scholars as well. So is, was there a defining moment? Anyone that wants to share? Young he Farad, anyone? Yeah, any of the young politicians? Yeah, Farad is, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, to be honest, uh, I, I wouldn't say that there was this one defining moment, but I, I had a, uh, exposure to politics and administration from my childhood because my father was a government official. And I, uh, I know for a fact, uh, being a believer in Fabian socialism, that the state has some responsibilities towards its citizens. Uh, I, I guess uh, it took the form of uh, going into politics uh, during my university years when I, I, I felt that in order to make sure that I can contribute to the process, uh, I have to get into the process because in Bangladesh, we have this uh, very strange culture in the last two decades where uh, anything to do with politics is something that educated youth uh, used to uh, avoid. And I always felt that uh, politics in Bangladesh would not get better by itself. I mean, people have to get involved with the intention of making it better. So it, it was not a very defining moment as such, but I would say it was a defining few years in my life, which ultimately led me to take the chance of, uh, you know, not having this uh, traditional career path and uh, going into politics. So it would be a defining uh, couple of years in my life. Thank you so much. Sorry, I move to the next question. If there is no one answering the next question, so we can like yeah, because we'll make sure the question get answered. We're already going on the time. So uh, there's a question. We have last question. So about uh, patriarchal culture, like how do how to deal with this patriarchal culture to enable women to move forward successful more successfully in politics. Can I chip in there? Yes, please. I think, I think there are two things that one can do. I think train one's children one day to respect women and the way that, that, that one raises uh, uh, children in the house, I think that's a long-term way to do it. But then also, I think uh, symbolically, the more women get represented, the more women are in positions, it, it becomes, women become a role model. It's not funny for women or it's not strange that women become politicians. So the more women stand for uh, polit being politicians or are seen in decision-making uh, 
positions, um, the more they will, and I think that's the only way to change it. I, th I think it's, it's very difficult uh, to change it overnight, but I think it can be changed uh, um, uh, by having more women, uh, featuring women more prominently. Thank you so much. The one last question we have uh, from, for Professor uh, Piscopo. Uh, uh, can you please elaborate uh, briefly about how uh, quotas help uh, Latin American countries in increasing gender equality? Sure. So, again, um, what's really important about quotas is that one, um, that they, they exist, but second, that they're enforced. Right, so I mentioned that what the quota law does is it requires that when political parties register the candidates that are standing for that party for the election, that they fill that quota, whether it's 30, 40, or, or now 50%. And so the key is enforcement, right? So in Latin America, the, um, the, the common penalty is that the political parties, if they don't fill the quota, can't enter candidates in that election. Right. If, and so that's a fairly high penalty. And so parties comply and parties comply because the election authorities uh, enforce the penalty. So this is actually really key. Right. We talk a lot about parties and the culture of parties changing, but the um, the role of election authorities, the civil servants, right, who staff election bodies, who make sure that election law is complied with is absolutely critical because they enforce the penalties related to quota laws. And when they say, well, you can't enter candidates in this district, you didn't fill the quota, that's a very high penalty on political parties. So in Latin America, it's been quite successful um, because, of the, because of the enforcement and because of the real commitment from election authorities um, to making gender equality a, a reality. And then on the last point, perhaps to end on the, you know, on the question of patriarchal culture, you know, we talk so much about what parties can do. I just mentioned what civil servants and bureaucrats can do. Um, and Professor Saidi mentioned the home, right? What we see across the board is that women um, do take on more public roles, whether that's in the workforce, um, in, in factories, in politics, on the boards of banks but their domestic roles are not changing. Across the globe, women speak to us about the double and triple shift of working in politics, working in business and coming home and still doing domestic work. The change that we have not seen in the past few decades is men's work in the home. It has not gone up, right? So men out there, you can start doing the dishes. And COVID-19 has really shown us the disproportionate burden of domestic work that falls on women. In the United States, job losses for women have not recovered while job losses for men have. So across the board, the home is where we start changing the distribution of labor. And the burden is not just on women to figure out how to do more with their time, it's also on men to change their behavior in the home and in public. Thank you. And I think that's the perfect note to come to the final, final remarks uh, for this event. Uh, what, uh, I just want to say briefly, like, for these problems, we realize globally, locally and regionally that this problem has structural cultural problem and problems. And in order to fix these problems about gender inequality, it's important that we take proactive action. So as has been shared about quotas, so this is just one of an example of the steps that we can take to increase gender equality. So to structure a problem, we have to take a proactive approach. And this starts from the home and it goes also outside. So we have to be proactive. And as we are here at Ampuro, we try to do as well with our diversity inclusion initiatives. We, are, we need to take proactive actions for structural problems. And I think this is the common thread that we can see between the scholars and the young politicians that's put with us. So I want to say thank you to each one of you that we participated for the extra time that you've taken to answer your question and participate in these events. I want to thank the scholars. I want to thank the politicians that participated today, not only for their time, but also for their precious insight and knowledge that they shared with us, with our students and with our faculty and staff. It's been truly appreciated and I appreciate it personally, but also I'm sure we appreciate it as well as a community. I want to say a big thank you to um, 
the Cancer Association. I want to say thank you for participating with us and organizing. I want to say thank you to Megan, especially, Megan especially to help us. Uh, we work together, uh, putting together this event. I want to say a big thank you. I want to thank also the director as well, Christian Angel. I want to thank each one of you for participating and taking your time for this uh, very engaging discussion. Uh, thank you, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, no, I'm sure like for any emails, I'm sure we work together with Megan to make sure that we can put the emails out there so you can be in touch with the young politicians and also with, um, with the scholars as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.